let me tell you why I teach. I am a language teacher. I've been teaching English language for the last eight years. And there's a reason why I teach English. And the reason is, English language teaching is fun. That's why I teach it. How many ships could a ship 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 if a ship ship could ship ships? This sentence is grammatically correct and it has meaning. So, another one. I'll let you read it. Language teaching is fun, right? Another example. So that's what language teachers do. We, we kind of perceive people in two ways. If a person has good language, if the person can acquire the language, the target language that we're trying to teach, then that person is intelligent. If that person cannot, then we're going to question that person's intelligence. Because that's the, that's the thing we're trying to teach. If the person can learn it, very good, that person is intelligent. If the person cannot perform, that means we, are, we don't believe that this person is intelligent. That's a very wrong theory or very wrong perception in teaching. If my students do not develop what I want them to develop, does not mean they're not capable of developing other skills. I'm sure all of you are aware of uh, multiple intelligence theory. Uh, the guy believes that if a person is not very good at learning English, that person may be very good at learning Spanish or maybe at math or maybe at something else. So, I mean, we, we, we really have to look at language. That's why I defined education in the beginning that it's not only delivering information to the other person, it's also facilitation of learning. So we are only as a medium between knowledge and the, the students that are trying to learn rather than being the, the people who make judgments about our students. Okay, so let's move on. Uh, in this presentation, we're going to talk about assessing students' needs, the ways we can assess those needs, some of the ways that I tried in the past, they worked, so I'm going to share, share them with you towards the end of the presentation. And then I'm also going to listen to you guys about what do you think about student needs and how you have tried to adapt your teaching strategies to your student needs in the past. So, uh, first question. To what extent do you think it is important to understand student needs and why? Anyone would like to share that idea? So have you, I mean, have you ever tried to assess your student needs in the past? Correct. Right. Correct. Right. How have you tried to assess your students' needs? Any instrument you used? Method? Right. Correct. Thank you. Anyone else who has tried to assess um, your students' needs? What, what are students' needs? Uh, my needs can be different from the person sitting on my left or right side. For example, as a student, my need was to understand what my teacher was saying because I could develop on that. But the person sitting on my left or right side needed more scaffolding than me. He needed more help in writing what the person was thinking. The person on my right, left side had different need. So the point I'm trying to make here is that we, we have believed in the past that all our students have same needs and we can use a common instructional method to facilitate or benefit all those students. 
uh, that theory has become a, uh, a past theory. Now the researchers have put a lot of effort into developing differentiated instructional methods. So what I mean by that is that for a class, let's say you are all my students, eight students, so all, all of you have different needs. Not all of you have same needs. So the instructional method I'm going to use will benefit all of you rather than one person. Uh, it's like you have a, uh, an assessment scale and on that scale you are assessing the talent of a monkey, an elephant, a fish, uh, a human being, a lion and the, the, t the task you're giving that person, the, the, I mean these students is to climb a tree. Can all of them do that? Of course not. So all the students in the classroom have different needs. So again, differentiated instructions. Why we need that is because if I have a common instructional style or method, I am going to address only specific students whose learning styles match with my instructional method. But if there's a student whose learning style is different from the way I teach, then that student is not going to learn from me. So that's the point I'm trying to make when I say you have to analyze your students' needs. There are different ways you can analyze. For example, one way is to have a survey in the classroom. I normally have a survey after the midterm and before the final exam. It's an informal survey, it's not a formal survey, and I do not share that material uh, in, in form of a report because that is only for my professional development and it's an opportunity for me to meet my students' needs. Okay. So it's an informal survey. And the questions are simple questions that my students normally ask. What do I like about this class? What I don't like about this class? How can I develop my language teaching? What should my teacher pay more attention to? So all these questions are actually uh, produced and passed on to me by my students. So after I do that, I go over the results of that survey in the class with my students so that we can discuss. I can have more uh, views on, on those findings from my students. And then we try to come up with a, with a method to address those needs that are mentioned in, in the survey by my students. For example, one thing my students have been saying again and again is we, we need more grammar lessons. So I asked my students one day that why do you need more grammar lessons? The thing teacher because it's part of the midterm exam, it's part of the final exam, we need grades. So I asked them do you really want to develop grammar only to have high grades? And majority of them said yes. That's the, that's the reason why we, uh, we need grades, I mean why we need to learn grammar. So we had a discussion about it and I clarified their values that you don't need to learn grammar only to get a higher grade. You also need it in your real life. Imagine I am a friend who lives in a different country, you want to invite me. The way you are going to communicate me, with me is going to give me a, an impression of you because I never had a direct impact or direct relation or uh, contact with you and the, this, this, this distant contact is going to develop my perception of you as a human being and that can affect our relationship in the future. So the, the grammar you're going to learn is not necessary for academic purposes, it's also necessary for the real life issues. Okay, so uh, let's talk about three misconceptions that we have in education, specifically in language teaching. Because I'm a language teacher, so I'm going to give you all the references from, uh, from language teaching. So the first misconception is that the needs of our students are similar to others. So when people say that my students who learn English language have same needs as a student learning chemistry, that, that, that is not the case. So this is first misconception that is addressed by uh, this researcher in detail in his book. Uh, uh, I think the name of the book is How to Differentiate Instructional Methods. Uh, he has written, produced two editions. So the second edition talks 
about this in more detail. A second mis uh, misconception is that our students learn in the same way and at the same rate as others. That's not the case. For example, my students who learn English can perform better than when they go in a math class. So their math skills may be different than their language skills. Same is the case with language skills and Arabic language skills. I mean, if you, you can draw a long list based upon these comparisons. The third misconception is that students and teacher expectations align. This is a research project that I am still working on. So uh, there are five parts of this research project. I have finished one. I'm working on the second one. Then I'm going to continue with the third, fourth, and fifth. So I'll, I'll talk about the one I have finished towards the end of the presentation. I'll show you the data, and I'll show you the, the results from the individual interviews I conducted with faculty members and students uh, to find out if student and teacher expectations match. What I mean by this is that some people think that what I say my students, what I think my students think the same way. Because we have a, an understanding, we have a good relationship. You can, be, you can have a friendly relationship with your students, but that does not mean you, you have same thinking towards learning and education. Okay. So that's what I'm going to address towards the end of the, uh, the uh, session. Okay. So just a look at the general challenges we have when we teach Arab students or students from outside. But most of these things are basically, I mean, most of these challenges are faced by teachers who teach in the, in the Middle East or Gulf students somewhere else, I mean, Arab students somewhere else. So, okay, so the first thing is cultural awareness. This is a concern both among teachers and students. Sometimes I say something that is not culturally appropriate for my students, so that can that can kind of create a distance between me and my students. Same is the case with students. Sometimes, sometimes students say something that I don't like because I come from a different culture. So that can cause a, a kind of uh, misunderstanding between teachers and students. And Osman, he's a Turkish researcher. He talks about that in a lot more detail than I can talk about today. Okay. Another thing is time management. We, we hear a lot of complaints from teachers that our students are not good at managing their time. We need to understand that these students are taking five courses at the same time. Then in addition to that, they have a lot of other responsibilities that they have to fulfill. For example, family, business, children, wife, society. So there's so many other uh, uh, issues that they have to deal with. Same is the case with teachers. My students sometimes complain, teacher, you don't answer my email over, over the weekend. I tell them, look, I, I spend a teacher's life for five days, and I answer your emails even at 12 p.m., at uh, 12 a.m. But I cannot answer your emails on a weekend because that's the time that I should spend with my family. Because if I don't create a balance, my life is going to be a disaster. My wife is not going to cook me breakfast. My son is not going to play with me, and uh, my neighbors are not going to talk to me when I need, uh, need them. So I need to create a balance to keep my life moving. OK. Instructions is another problem that teachers have or students have uh, in our uh, language classes. So what I mean by that is that in the exam, students normally ask the, the, the examiner or the invigilator about the questions because they do not understand them. So when my students have those problems in the midterm, I pay a lot of attention on developing their habit of reading the instructions when we do the practice quizzes. Because that's a very bad habit. Students always try to rely upon the teacher who teaches them in the class. So I, from the very beginning of the class, I make rule that you have to ask me questions when we practice, but when I'm going to give you a quiz, it could be a practice quiz, it could be a, a real quiz, you are not going to ask me questions because 
all the answers were provided when we were practicing the specific uh, the topic. So this develops their habit as a learner and when they go in the exam and I'm not there, they have, the, they have developed this habit of reading instructions and an, an, an idea of how to understand the instructions because they have done that so many times in the class. So they don't need the examiner's or the uh, facilitator's help during the, the real exam. Okay, and uh, these two guys talk in a lot more detail in Qatari context. I think both of them are uh, Qataris and they, uh, they produce the, their uh, thesis for their PhDs and they talk a lot more in, uh, about instructions in their uh, research projects. Okay. Students and assignments, lack of motivation on the, uh, on the side of the teachers and the students. Students always complain, teacher, you give a lot of work. Teachers always complain that students, you do not work, you do not submit your assignments on time. So uh, this guy talks about that in a lot more detail. And he also tries to find out the reasons why we have this lack of motivation in terms of submitting assignments. Student attitude, behavior towards learning, that's another thing that uh, the researcher talked about. And a few of the reasons that he mentioned is that probably the students had a very bad experience in schools. So that experience becomes a habit which is very difficult to get rid of and then they kind of live their life based upon or with that habit. And those are the challenges that we face in our uh, classes. Another factor that he talked about is the lack of relationship, rapport between teacher and student. That can create a lot of problems in class. So when I have these kind of problems, I normally talk to that specific student after the class. I, I had uh, I, I mean, I experienced it in my first semester here. I had a student who will be on his, would be on his phone all the time, talking out of turn, not bringing his uh, book to the classroom. So I spoke with him in the class during the lesson, but that created a lot of problems because he was feeling embarrassed because I was talking about him in front of all the peers. So. I learned from that experience. Uh, if two semesters ago, I had two girls uh, from a very good family, but they had the same problem. They were talking, 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 using their phone. And when I would fi finish talking about a topic, they would raise their hand and say, teacher, can you please explain it? And I'm like, ah, I have to go over it again. How many times? So one day I decided to speak with them. I mean, I was feeling not to speak with them because they were not showing respect to me, but then I realized they're here to learn. And it's my job to teach them how to learn because I am a facilitator of learning. So I spoke with them after the class and I said, oh, I mean, the way I spoke with them actually worked. So I said, um, do you think I need to develop something? I said, teacher, what happened? No, I, I really want to understand why you guys keep talking to each other you play with your phones. I have a uh, belief that if you do that, it means I'm a bad teacher. I'm, I'm, I have failed to catch your attention. And they literally started crying. They said, teacher, you are a great teacher. We really respect you. I think we were just trying to be bad students. And then the next day, one of that student, because I had a teacher who te taught class before me, I think he was a physics teacher, he would write on the wall and not remove it. So that student was doing that job for me. She was cleaning the wall and she was arranging the papers and I said, what happened to you today? She said, teacher, I just realized that I was, I was being a bad student so I'm trying to show you respect. So I think these, student, these kind of issues arise because there's lack of understanding or there's lack of discussion between teacher and student. Okay. Uh, technology, online education. I know a lot of people talk about technology these days. We, we need to embed technology into education so that 
we can increase student learning and language acquisition. Uh, I'm going to discuss it at the end of the uh, presentation the way I address this issue. But I, uh, Valenta has, has explained that you only use technology or you only embed technology in education if it works. If it creates problems for your students, then you should question the use of technology in education. For example, I was teaching a group of Spanish students back in the States and we were working on a project where we were using voice thread to teach them speaking. So this was a voluntary uh, free language school. So students would come learn English, they won't, they won't pay anything and they would just go outside work in the community and that was the only goal. So we spent first three weeks teaching students how to use VoiceThread and in the fourth week when students had learned how to use VoiceThread they stopped coming to the classroom. We contacted a couple of them and asked them why don't they come to class. They said, teacher, we came there to learn English, not technology and not using voice thread. So we spent a lot of time learning how to use computer rather than developing our English. So you have wasted three weeks of our time and we cannot spend another week uh, learning about a new technolo technology or uh, an instrument. So <clears throat> use of technology in education only if it helps in learning. So Valentina is a good source to read that. Fight on grades and marks and points. I'm sure all of you had it last week. I had it. Um, a student contacted me with a wonderful email. Teacher Ramadan Kareem, I'm sure you're enjoying your Ramadan. Uh, may Allah give you blessings. Da -da -da -da. I just need five points. And you're going to go to Jannah if you give that to me. I said, what if I don't? Where am I going to go? So, but I mean, of course, five points is a lot, so I politely replied to that student that you basically earn grades. I can't give you grades as if it's a candy. You have to earn grades. And there's a way you earn grades, and the way is to work in the classroom and perform better on the, on the tests. So th there's no other way I can give you grades. Finally, money is another problem in teaching. Uh, there are people who work for money, there are people who work for uh, community, uh, there are people who work for different things, so this is another problem why, uh, and these three guys talk about that, that uh, they, they did a research in Saudi Arabia that the, the country is spending a lot of money on education, but the results are very disappointing. Uh, th this, all this money is going in waste because Learning is not happening. Okay. So, self-fulfilling prophecy is another issue. Uh, this was discovered in 19, I think in the 80s. But what this means is that a teacher walks into a classroom with preconceived notions or preconceived ideas. And he he sees his students developing only if they meet his expectations. For example, I expect my students to bring a textbook, their uh, uh, notebook, a pencil, and I want them to turn off their phones, I want them to listen to me, uh, participate in discussions, uh, get very good grades, and then be very respectful. If they do these eight things, then they are working well. But if they don't, then I don't see them progressing. So, but this can affect learning because all the assessments and all the lessons that I'm going to design will be based upon this perception that I come with to the classroom. So, and that, that's what I investigated in the, the research that I mentioned where I was trying to see if students and teacher expectations match or not. Okay. So challenges in learning that our students have, understanding the curriculum, that's one thing that my students complain about all the time and that's why they send me multiple emails saying, teacher, what is the deadline for this task? And I, 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 I would tell them about the deadline five or six times but they will still 
ask me questions. When are we going to do that task? When is the speaking exam? When is the reading exam? <clears throat> Spelling issues? Because I'm a language teacher, so I noticed that. Uh, phonetic issues, pronunciation problems, and writing. Uh, my students have a lot of writing problems, but they have high level of speaking and low level of writing. Ong talks about that in detail. And then finally, Google Translation. Right? So these are the challenges that my students face. And there's a reason. There's, there are possible reasons why we have these problems. For example, understanding the curriculum, too much information in the first week. So I remember in the, in the first week of the, the, uh, the uh, course, our facilitators tell us to go over the syllabus in the class in one day, in a 15 minutes class. Who on earth can absorb all that information, memorize it, and then make use of that information throughout the semester? So probably we, what I do is I split or I divide the syllabus in two halves. The syllabus that is related to the, the assignments and the task before the midterm and the syllabus that is related to the tasks after the midterm. So we talk about the content that we're going to go over before the midterm in detail. Of course, we, I have to repeat it after, after a couple of weeks. And then in the sec second half, we talk about the syllabus that is related to the final exam. Uh, spelling issues, different alphabets and different teaching methods. Okay. Phonetic issues, different alphabets. For example, in, in Arabic, we don't have sounds like pa, ta, da. We have ba sound, and a lot of time my students confuse that with p. So that's why we see, we see problems like, I mean, not problems, but problems. So they use b with that, because those sounds do not uh, exist in Arabic. Uh, orality and culture. So this is discussed in a lot of detail by Ong in his book, Orality and Culture. And he clearly says that, Arab culture is a community-based culture. People love to talk. So if you ask a Qatari student to sit in the library and study for four hours, he's going to kill you. Because people like to move. People are friendly. People want to talk to someone. So it's very hard for people to sit in a quiet place and study for hours and hours. But if you ask them, to work on a speaking task, they'll be ready in, in one minute. But this, this can also be a, an issue in language teaching. For example, we have a speaking task in embedded program that I teach. So students have to work in, uh, in a group. So they have specific roles that they have to perform. But because they have high level of speaking, they do not prepare for the task. And because they do not fulfill the, the roles that they have to for the specific task, their grades go lower. And they come complain, teacher, I have very good speaking, but I, 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 I received a very low score. And I tell them that, of course you have very good speaking skills, but you did not meet the requirements of the task. If you don't do that, I cannot give you grades. So this is a positive point, but we have to develop on that. This is a point that we need to pay more attention to, but we need to create a balance between speaking and writing. Okay, finally, Google translation is because of lack of confidence or it's a habit. We have been doing that for a long period of time, so it's very hard for me to write down a sentence on my own because I want to check with Google before I send it to my teacher. Okay. Uh, cultural considerations, I'm just going to go over it quickly. Classroom conventions, for example, absences and late, privacy issues, talk out of turn, then family life, marriage responsibilities, and then go on. Uh, personal independ independence, religious issues, and schooling. So all these are problems that we need to consider when we teach students here. They're not just here to learn, they have so many things to take care of outside the classroom. So the point I'm trying to make is that a lot of time we stereotype students. We think they're not working. 
they're not learning, they're dull, they, they cannot perform well, it's because they are not here to learn. They, they I mean, sorry, they, they don't come here only to learn with an open mind or with an empty mind, they bring a lot of issues that are somewhere in their subconsciousness that always stop them from performing in a way that we expect them to perform. Teenagerism, we need to understand that our students are teens. The, the student range, range that I teach is from 18 to 30. So if I expect them to work the same way I do, I think uh, my expectations are a lot. So I'm expecting a lot from a teen. They, they have to do so many of the things. So they're not, I mean, they're not going to work on the tasks that I give them all the time. And uh, Cummins talks about the issues that teens have in, in education. Overgeneralization, complaints, we, I mean, if I have one student, if I have a problem with one student, probably I would just generalize when I talk to a colleague. I had a very bad day today because my students just, just ruined my mood. It was just one student, probably two or three or four, but it's not the entire uh, community. Education and intelligence. We, sometimes people confuse education with intelligence. I can be intelligent. What happened to you? Okay. So I can be intelligent, but I may not be a good student. I can be a good student, but I may not be intelligent. So we need to differentiate education from intelligence. Okay. Student errors. There are two types of errors that students commit or make in education. The first type is called competence errors and the second type is called performance errors. Tochi talks about that in, in, in detail and this was a paper presented at JALT, Japanese uh, conference. What he meant by performance errors is that sometimes people are tired or they are in a hurry. So the type of the, the mistakes that the, these students make is not because of their lack of understanding of the task. It, it's because of these two things. And these are less serious errors. These are not very serious errors. And we can overcome them with little effort. For example, creating activities that can refresh students' minds, uh, discussing problems with the students, trying to know a student's problems, and then trying to to scaffold with that specific challenge that the student is going through. The second type is competence errors. This is w which is more serious because it's, it reflects inadequate learning. The student has not mastered, mas mastered the task that I'm trying to teach the student. Or the student does not develop the, the language competency that I expect that student to develop. And this is where I need to put a lot of effort into to develop my students' uh, language skills. Linguistic consideration, what I mean by this is three questions. And th this is taken from uh, this presenter. Are people aware of the differences between Arabic and English in terms of vocabulary, grammar, pronunciation, literacy, script? One is written from the left side, the other one is written from the right side. Alphabets are different, sounds are different, so there's so many things that people need to consider. How these differences affect English language learning of Arab students? We also need to consider that, correct? And what other language learning strengths and challenges do Arab students generally have? If, if my student is bad at writing, he is good at speaking. So again, I have to create a balance. I have to kind of allow my student to develop a positive point as well as the negative points. Not just ignore the one and pay more attention to the other one. Okay. So, teaching practices. These are the, uh, the ways I, I, try, I use to facilitate my students in their learning by assessing their needs. So the first thing I do is publicly praise positive behavior and show my students that I'm celebrating their achievements. Okay. I, I don't do that, of course I don't do that in class and all the time. For example, if a student gets an A and the other student gets a D, I don't praise that student who gets A. There's a way that I, 
I uh, kind of devised this semester. I, I would give them a challenge on every Sunday and then I give them four days to find out what that thing is. For example, recently I gave them a picture of a plant. It was a potato plant. I was growing that in my garden. So I took picture of the plant and I told them, you have to find this out and you have to tell me by Wednesday. If you do that, I'll, I will announce you as a winner with your name, your ID, and your family name. That's, that's the famous chord that we need to hit. Students really feel happy when I tell them, oh, your family name is going to be announced because you won the competition. So they Googled it. They tried to con contact their relatives, their friends, people from around the world. And then they would pass on the answers to me, and I will announce their names as winners. Then I would ask them to, uh, to answer a question about language. For example, find out, I mean, write down a word. For example, a word that I used uh, for this, I, I used it to teach them prefixes and suffixes. And the word was very simple. All right. I gave them the task that if you can read this word on Thursday, of course I wrote it on Sunday, and they had to read it on Thursday. They spent four days trying to learn this word and how to pronounce it. Of course, I pronounced it three times in the class, anti disestablishmentarianisms But all of them probably lost, got lost over here. So they were fine until here, but they made some mistakes because it's a long word and you need practice. But this helped them in pronouncing longer words. And in the next class, when I gave them words like uh, disestablish, they were okay with that because they, they learned how to pronounce anti disestablish meant Aryanism. Right? So I told them this is a root word. You can add words in the beginning of this word. You can add words at the end to change the meaning and the category of the word. Oh, I mean the family of the word. So the person who was able to pronounce this word, I announced that person's name through Blackboard, saying this person was successful at pronouncing this word. This person's name is this, and this person's family name is this. So this somehow motivated them in uh, participating in the classroom activities and then paying attention to what I was saying. Okay. The other thing I do is I involve them in decision making. For example, I, I send out surveys, we do voting and polling. An example of that is choosing the deadline for submitting an assignment. So I ask my students, when do you want the deadline to be? Some said, teacher, make it Friday so that we can uh, work on a weekend. Some said, teacher, make it Sunday. Uh, teacher, make it Saturday. And one said, teacher, make it 11.59 p.m. If we, 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 we miss one minute, it's going to become Sunday, and you will m minus one mark from our uh, score. I said, fine. Works, works for me. So this was decided by students. So the students who submitted assignments after 11.59 p.m., did not come to ask me to not minus a mark because the deadline was chosen by them, not by me. So they had to abide by the deadline that they chose. Okay. Third, do a needs assessment survey. For example, I did a survey. As I said, it was just a, an informal survey. I asked them questions like this. How do you feel about this class? Uh, the survey looked like this. So simple questions, how do you feel? What do you like the most about this course? And then we discussed the results. I mean, I could see the results, and I showed them the summary of responses. This was before the midterm. So one person said, fully satisfied. 
seven people said good and two said not satisfied so I asked these people why you think it's good why not partially satisfied or why not fully satisfied and we asked people why not satisfied and then comments of people were discussed and then finally I asked them about their preferences what do you want your teacher to pay more attention to a lot of them said grammar and I, as I said in the beginning of the presentation we talked about why we need to learn grammar and then we kind of uh, discuss it and try to reach a, an agreement that we, we're going to pay attention to grammar but not a lot of attention to grammar because it's only 10% of the total so if we spend 15 classes on grammar then we may not be able to finish the other tasks okay then Uh, help your students to develop a habit of reading instructions as I gave example that I make them read instructions during the practice tasks so that when they go to the exam they know how to read the instructions and uh, understand them then consider value clarification as a teaching method what I mean by this is uh, let me give you an example of grammar so we discuss why we need to learn grammar so we know that we need to learn grammar to get good marks in the grammar component of the exam we also need to learn grammar to develop our English so that I can leave a good impression of myself on the person I talk to same is the case with speaking same is the case with reading and writing and uh, so I remember one example I know we're running out of time my students complained that teacher you use a rubric in the writing uh, uh, component why do we need a rubric why don't you just give us marks based upon our performance you know we are good students so I told them look we train you to meet the rubric because we want you to follow specific requirements so if you are successful at meeting these requirements in a classroom you will develop a specific skill so when you go in your in your practical life you work as as a an employee at somewhere and your, job, your boss gives you a specific task and you have to meet four requirements to prepare this uh, project or report that your teacher gave you should be confident because you have done that as a student again and again so you know how to prepare something specific to the requirements so that's the value clarification that we, we need to link their learning to their real life and that's how they can feel more motivated towards uh, achieving that skill uh, here are some of the skills for example uh, let me go to the speaking activity so we went to we had a speaking uh, task in the beginning of sorry in after the midterm so I asked my students to prepare a PowerPoint and they will talk about a real life issue that they face a student talked about population increasing population in Qatar this was three years ago I was really surprised that a person is concerned about that kind of issue this was in the first semester of the foundation program that I was teaching so he talked about the increase in population jobs healthcare education facilities and the way we can decrease it or the way we can handle this problem so kind of linked the speaking task to the real life issue he wanted to become a businessman in uh, I think he wanted to go in marketing so probably this was a skill that he wanted to develop that could help him in the future okay uh, incorporate technology only if it works as I said in the beginning and here is what I normally say when people ask me to make sure I use technology <clears throat> so you don't have to try everything I mean, it's not your circus these are not your monkeys you can just let it go okay uh, keep a journal about your teaching experience for example this is the way I do so these are some of the mistakes that my students repeat again and again I collected all the mistakes we went over those mistakes in the classroom uh, of course I did not address those students but 
I showed them an example for example my teacher is intelligent sorry over there uh, Mecca it is a beautiful city Mecca is a beautiful city they repeat the noun again uh, twice so I gave them the example that you need to avoid this and their, their writings were better after we went over these mistakes okay then <clears throat> Filter effective teaching to facilitate learning. There is so much out there and we have to make sure that we use the one that benefits our students. For example, what works for Japanese students may not work for Arab students. What works for Arab students may not work for Japanese students. Okay. So, uh, this was the research I talked about. I'm trying to align the teacher's expectations with the student's expectations and we're trying to read a consensus or a way we can uh, design so that teachers and students work together rather than taking two different paths. By letters I mean teachers expectations, by letter here I mean students expectations. So I was trying to align. Okay, so uh, this was the survey that was sent out. It was about responsibilities of the students. What do teachers think our students responsibilities what do students think are students responsibilities so I gave them nine items out of those nine items five were found significant so here are the t-test results okay as you can see that in uh, on the first two items teacher had teachers had higher expectations but on the next three items students had higher expectations so their expectations did not match. So I interviewed people. I wanted to know if this is the case uh, in their real life or it's different. So what came out was 80% of the faculty disagreed with the findings of the survey. They think it's not true. But the comments that they provided on, these, on, on this data showed that basically these align with their observations. So indirectly they accepted, but uh, they, they refuse to uh, accept it. 64 percent of students disagreed, 27 students agreed with the results and 10 percent agreed only with non-Gulf Arabs but they did not agree with the Gulf Arabs. Okay, so I asked them how we can decrease the gap between the two. The recommendations for faculty were these four because lack of time I'm just going to go over this quickly develop a mutual understanding then we need to respect that uh, understanding they called it a mutual understanding contract so teachers can do that in the beginning of the semester for example ask students what do they expect tell students what I as a teacher expect and then we reach a consensus and then we follow that consensus throughout the semester and we make sure no one uh, kind of diverse from those, uh, those kind of rules so that people can uh, perform better. Okay, recommendations for students. Uh, develop the needed skills for language development and discuss problems and issues with each other. Means teachers and students discuss their problems. Finally, some recommendations for university. They need to enforce rules and regulations, especially about plagiarism, absences, and all other uh, serious issues and finally offer study skills courses our students want to learn but not all of them know how to learn they know what to learn but they may not but they may need more help in learning how to learn that specific skill okay um, this was an email that I received from my student last last night uh, he was appreciating what I did for that student and he was, he wanted to know my feedback on his performance throughout the semester. I replied to him saying that because you did not tell me in the beginning of the semester, so I did not collect any data. However, here's my feedback. So I don't have these, stud these type of students in my class or all the classes. There's only one or two, but they keep me going. And those are the reasons why I continue uh, teaching as a passionate teacher as some people said so uh, some people think that this may not make any difference on what I said
finally, I just going to show this one minute video and this will uh, show you why I am doing it. So here we go. One day, a man was walking along the beach when he noticed a boy picking up starfish and throwing them into the ocean. Approaching the boy, he asked, Excuse me, but what are you doing? The boy replied, Throwing starfish back into the ocean. The sun is rising and the tide is going out. If I don't throw them back, they'll die. The man laughed to himself and said, but there's too many starfish on this beach. You can't possibly make a difference. After listening politely, the boy bent down, picked up another starfish and threw it into the ocean. Then turning to the man, he said, I made a difference to that one. So the final thought is that make a difference to at least one. Uh, I made a difference to this person who sent me an email last night, and I'm very happy that at least I made a difference for one person. Uh, that is the end of the session. Thank you very much for coming. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer. All right. Thank you very much.